My name is Garth Reynolds, the Executive Director of the Illinois Pharmacists Association, and welcome to Pharmacy Legislation Review in preparation for the 2017 Illinois Pharmacy Legislative Day. We will review the following objectives. Discuss the pharmacy-related legislation from the 2017 session of the 100th General Assembly. Describe the status of pharmacy-related federal legislation, including provider status. And discuss the status of IPHA-sponsored legislation initiatives for 2017. As this is a preparation program, I'd like to review just some aspects of the association itself in relation to legislative and advocacy. As you know, with any program that we do, it has to be founded in our mission statement. And as you know, the association is dedicated to enhancing the professional competency of pharmacists, advancing the standards of practice, improving rational drug use and medication optimization, and leading to the resolution of public policy issues. And since we are the voice for pharmacy in Illinois, and we've been doing this since December of 1880, I still think that this October 1880 membership flyer, Druggist of Illinois, Elevate Your Profession, Protect Your Business, is just as true today as it was 137 years ago. And as your association, we assist you with your professional development, advocate for you on a government level, both on a federal and state level, and we'll be focusing on that aspect today. The societal relations and encouraging you to be part of your community and how you can help other non-healthcare professional groups understand pharmacy issues. Research and, and information and providing the key up-to-date knowledge of what's going on in the profession. Encouraging you to interact and network with your fellow pharmacists, student pharmacists and technicians. Helping to develop best practices for ethics and standards for our profession and organizational relationships, not only between our pharmacy partners, but also with our interprofessional colleagues and other healthcare professions. As stated earlier, we'll be focusing on the political advocacy component of the association today and how we monitor federal and state legislation that impacts your profession, your practice, and your patients. And also just want to remind you that there is a state legislative tracking report under the advocacy section of IPHA.org. It is a real-time report and it does take a couple of seconds for it to pull since it is real time and it's, and it's updated every time you click on the link for the, for the uh, bill report. As a reminder, Legislative Day is this upcoming March 15th, next Wednesday. So please do come. Registration, online registration has ended. Um, if you are coming and attending, we, uh, we welcome you. And um, if you are still thinking about wanting to try to come, please call the office at 217-522-7300. This is the um, simple process of how a bill becomes law in Illinois. And it doesn't matter if it starts in the House or in the Senate. It all starts with an idea. And that idea gets presented to the um, Legislative Reference Bureau to formulate the language. And you find a sponsor for your bill. And let's say this, this starts in the House. So it goes to what's called first reading. The clerk introduces the bill. It gets assigned a number. Then it goes to the Rules Committee in the House or the Senate. If it's in the Senate, it's Assignments Committee. And that's a, a leadership committee. And they decide where the bill goes for further committee review. So in the House, there are many different committees um, that are a little bit more detailed than they are in the Senate, just because they have double the members in that chamber. So a lot of our health care bills usually start off in um, the House because they have a committee focusing just on health care licenses. Its companion in the Senate is license activities and pensions. And so that, that committee has a lot more scope and it has to deal with everything from um, firemen pensions, police departments, um, barbers, architects, all the way down to pharmacists, physicians, and nurses. So in the House with the healthcare licenses, that gives us a more focused and detailed debate. 
So when that bill comes out, if it, if it doesn't have any additional amendments and it's passed to the floor, it goes to what's called second reading. And that is a time for short debate and time for additional floor amendments to be added if necessary. Then it moves to what's called third reading, which is the, what we traditionally think of as the full debate and the floor vote. If it does pass the chamber, then it goes to this opposite chamber. So in our example, we said we started in the House and it goes to the Senate and it starts this process all over again. And as it goes through, it gets passed, goes through the first, first reading, going through assignments, second reading and third reading gets passed. Now it goes to the governor. And the governor has two choices. He can either pass it or veto it. And if he passes it, it becomes law. If he vetoes it, in Illinois, our governor has three options. He can either total veto, line item veto, or a mandatory veto. So total veto means he doesn't like the entire bill, he sends it back. Line item veto means he doesn't like this word here, this sentence here. He can start editing the, the, the um, bill itself. Or a mandatory veto, he can put in his own language as a supplement to what was in the, in the past bill the bill that presented him by both houses. So in that case, then it goes back to both the House and the Senate, and they have to both override him with two-thirds majority vote and it, for that bill to pass as is originally um, presented to the governor. So let's talk more about the 100th General Assembly. Both the House and the Senate are under Democratic majority. The Republicans did make some gains in the most recent election. Where this was really showed a change of position was in the House. Both the House and the Senate and the 99th General Assembly have what was called supermajority status, meaning that the Republicans could either vote all against or all for a bill, and it doesn't, didn't matter. So now the Republicans gained enough seats that they can't do that in the House anymore, so it should encourage more negotiation and bipartisan um, compromise. In the Senate, they still preserved their, their supermajority even with some of the gains that the Republicans had um, during the last election. Our legislators have been very busy and have presented over 6,000 bills um, for this session to review and to examine. And the General Assembly session, as a reminder, is a two-year session that begins on January 1 of 2017 and it goes until December 31st of next year. And this is the same as Congress. It just happens to be that Illinois is in sync with Congress on our terms. So both Congress and our General Assembly are two-year terms. They're in the 115th Congress and we're in the 100th General Assembly. So we have many different committees, which we kind of discussed in the overview of how a bill becomes law. And this just shows you the extended list of the various committees that we are usually monitoring or active in as the bills go through the General Assembly process. In addition to the General Assembly, we also help monitor bills as they are enacted and will be enacted by the executive departments under the governor. In these departments, the most common one that you're familiar with is the Department of Financial and Professional Regulation, or DFPR. This is where the Board of Pharmacy sets, and this is what governs your license. The Department of Healthcare and Family Services, you know it better as Medicaid. The Department of Human Services does two things that we interact with. One, they help administer the Controlled Substance Act, and your more day-to-day -day operation interaction with them is they administer the Illinois Prescription Monitoring Program. The Department of Insurance oversees all commercial and private insurance. The Department of Public Health, we don't statutorily have a um, interaction with them, but IPHA does interact with them on many different grant programs. Currently, we're working with them on a chronic, chronic disease program, a grant program with the CDC, and also a medical countermeasures program um, through the CDC as well. And then finally, there's the Illinois CMS. And what we mean by CMS in this state is the Central Management Services. So Central Management Services is the HR department. And the reason we interact with them is because they help receive the state employees um, insurance program. These are the various acts which we help monitor over the, over the course of the General Assembly session. And looking at any piece of legislation that amends any of these acts that affect our profession, our practice, and our patients. Now let's review pharmacy-related legislation in the 2017 spring session. 
The first bill is House Bill 274 concerning contraceptives. It is, was introduced by Representative Michelle Musman of Schaumburg, and this would add prescribing and dispensing of hormonal contraceptives to the definition of the practice of pharmacy. And this is a major change for the profession as this is a, 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 an essential piece of legislation to give us prescribing authority that is not dependent on another provider. Pharmacists who would do this would have to complete an additional training course. Patients who would receive care from pharmacist providers under this bill would have to complete a self-screening risk assessment tool prior to dispensing, um, not unlike the um, self-screening uh, questionnaire that we utilize in immunization care. Pharmacists would be required to refer the patient to a primary care provider or women's care practitioner if they meet certain requirements. Um, similar to how we do that in immunization care. And after three years, the patient would need to follow up with a primary care provider or a women's health care um, practitioner. Now this bill, um, it did come up in the last session. We did get uh, some really great subject matter hearing on this, on this piece of legislation about the value of a pharmacist and why it would be a great endeavor for the state to expand public health in this arena and allowing pharmacists to help with decreasing the number of unwanted pregnancies. This bill continues to go forward. So there may be some amendment language coming out in this next week that will amend it not, to not only cover oral contraceptive medications, but also any, it would include all self-administered contraception. Drug Manufacturers, House Bill 239, being brought forward by in the House by Representative Mary Flowers and in the Senate by Iris Silverstein. And this would amend the Illinois Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, and it would require both manufacturers of generic and brand medications to notify the state and others, other stakeholders 60 days before they would um, implement a price increase. But it would only require the General Assembly to conduct an annual public hearing of the trends of the, of the, of the pricing over that last term. And it would also have to have disclosures if, if the medications cause dependency. Now this causes us hesitation because it doesn't look at anything on PBM rebates or any of the other pricing mechanisms that are utilized by PBMs in, in formulating their reimbursement tables, which we feel that would need to be added to something like this. But only having an annual public hearing doesn't really do anything of causing the problem except trying to bring in a more of a political show. And um, so as of right now, we're, we're against the bill as it currently is written. House Bill 240, being brought forward by Representative Mary Flowers of Chicago, would amend the Insurance Code and the Pharmacy Practice Act and would put in a number of privacy um, prohibitions on, on uh, the sale and transfer of data. Now, what this, nothing in this bill seems to be anything that's being more restrictive than what's already being handled under federal HIPAA and high tech laws. So we're against the bill because there's no reason to duplicate that on a state level. House Bill 2392 being brought forward by Mary Flowers. This bill is in a response to the um, Chicago Tribune article that in, in the past December and its subsequent um, article follow-up articles. And if you haven't um, had a chance to look at the articles of the investigation from the Chicago Tribune, please do take a look at those. If you just Google Chicago Tribune Pharmacy, You'll find a number of articles and, and also articles with our um, comments and feedback on, on that article. And I don't want to go any further into that there as in respect of your time. But um, there have been some uh, um, activity from the governor's office and the Department of Financial and Professional Regulations in response to this article. And we'll talk about those more at legislative day. But let's focus here on House Bill 2392. And this would amend the Pharmacy Practice Act and it would amend more focusedly the definition of a, what's the requirements of a pharmacy. And as we go through the issues of this bill, remember this would impact every pharmacy practice setting, not just one certain particular practice, but would actually impact all practice settings. So it would require that at least one registered technician would have to be on duty whenever pharmacy practice is conducted. It required that pharmacies could not fill more than 10 prescriptions per hour. We've been told by the sponsor this is, should be um, stating pharmacist, but that still doesn't give a lot of wiggle room because of 
if there's going to be restrictions on this, you're going to have increased labor restrictions. Require 10 technician hours per 100 prescriptions filled. Prohibitions on pharmacies from requiring pharmacists to participate in advertising or soliciting activities that take away from patient care. Um, provide pharmacists shall receive specified break periods and require pharmacies to maintain a record of any errors in the receiving, filling, and dispensing of prescriptions. So IPHA and other pharmacy stakeholders, including ICHP and IRMA, we have a number of concerns about this bill. And specifically, as I go forward, our com the, my comments will be focused just on IPHA's position. We look at this as trying to create a cookie cutter solution to a lot larger problem. There are some elements of this that do have some validity um, when you're looking at the breaks and the non-solicitation practices, but there are some components of this that are just not reasonable. Um, when we're looking at the 10 prescriptions per hour, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation in 2015 states that Illinois dispensed 165 million prescriptions, and that's just community. Not talking about mail order, not talking about health system, not talking about long-term care, not talking about specialty, just community. 165 million prescriptions. If you look at the if you look at the number of pharmacies that are licensed by the department, it's about just shy of 3,800 pharmacies, but only about 2,600 of them are actually in the state. So let's just say, for the state sake of argument and calculation, tw those 2,600 pharmacies are all outpatient. They're going to let's say they're all open 12 hours a day, seven days a week, with one pharmacist on duty. If you calculate that out, the 120 prescriptions they would be doing a day per week times a year, we would still be 46 million prescriptions short. And the Kaiser Family Foundation also states that every household in Illinois has on average about 12.5 prescriptions. So at any given time during the year, 3.5 million households will be to have been denied care through that year with legislation of these type of limits. So this is why we think it's there's a lot of lot of room that needs for improvement with this bill. But it comes down to a couple of issues that have been that haven't been fully addressed either by the investigated article or with this bill. This bill is focusing on issues that have to do with workflow and operational design. We understand these issues, but IPHA has had a long time policy against the setting of quotas and against the setting of any type of legislation of this type of restriction. Now we feel that the, that there are changes that need to be made in some practice settings, but we feel that that is not a public policy issue. That is an issue for intercompany and stakeholders to work together to create best practices. We're willing to work with all the groups to help come to a solution on this because one thing that we have to make sure is our patients have to have access to quality and timely care. We took an oath to our patients and we have to make sure that our practice settings not only adhere to that oath, but promote that oath. In addition to that, this none of the proposals that have been made either by this legislation or by the recommendations of DFPR get to the sole problem of this that's causing a lot of the strain of this issue, the core problem, and that is the lack of proper reimbursement to pharmacies by PBMs and Medicaid when it comes to reimbursing for the medications being dispensed to patients. And we're not even talking about the lack of payment for your professional services that you provide each and every day, whether it's patient counseling, immunization care, disease management, medication optimization. These are professional services that you are not getting reimbursed for. And this is where we have to have a change in the profession and the change in, of the paradigm to get you paid for your products that you're bringing in into dispensing and get recognition 
and, and reimbursement for the services that you provide. Other healthcare professionals have it, and it's time for pharmacy to have it. House Bill 2436 is a, um, we usually see a version of a universal health care bill come forward, and that, that this is this session's version. Um, this one's a little bit different. Usually it would cover populations that weren't covered under the Affordable Care Act, but this one would actually include all resident, all individuals in the state, and it would um, set forth some provider reimbursement standards, uh, make it unlawful for any other private insurer to sell insurance that would duplicate the coverage, um, and create a pharmaceutical and durable medical committee, um, durable medical goods committee. Um, and those of you who may have been around for a while, those are terms we haven't used since the old circuit breaker program in the 80s and 90s. So um, this bill has been um, assigned to committee, but has not moved at all in the last uh, couple weeks. Now let's talk about um, disposal of medications, House Bill 524 and Senate Bill 680. Um, being brought forward by Representative Wheeler and Senator Althoff. This would amend the Safe Pharmaceutical Disposal Act and the Environmental Protection Act. This would allow law enforcement facilities to be able to have the ability to destroy medications um, through a drug destruction device. And more than likely, this is a type of incinerator um, that, similar to what they use now for their illicit medications that they obtain from criminals um, and, they, and they don't normally go through a normal destruction process, um, they usually get incinerated. And this would allow for the medication being, being, being brought in through take-back initiatives to be done through the same way instead of being had to sent off to a um, EPA facility and trying to help with controlling the costs. Um, this, is, this, is, this is being brought forward by the Lake County um, legislators. In, during the most, one of the more recent takebacks, Illinois took in 47 tons of medication, and 25 of that came from Lake County. So this is a significant problem and a burden on these law enforcement um, departments that are helping their communities by getting this medication out of the medicine cabinet, off the streets, but we have to give them a reasonable way of getting rid of it, and that's why we're in favor of this bill. It has moved out of both the House and Senate committees and should be ready for floor discussion at any time. Uh, controlled Substance Withholding, House Bill 707 by Representative Belllock. This would amend the Controlled Substance Act, and basically it would provide additional penalties for anyone who provided false information to a pharmacist or prescriber in a trying to obtain um, controlled substance medication. This bill has seemed to have stalled, and we're not sure if it's going to be moving any, any, any more during this session, at least at this time. Um, but we are definitely in favor of increasing penalties for individuals who are... Um, providing false information or withholding information from us to obtain controlled substances. House Bill 2511, this is addressing the SMART Act. And as you know, the SMART Act limits us to four medications for traditional fee-for-service Medicaid patients. And this would exempt patients specifically in long-term care facilities. This bill has come through a number of um, versions of it in the past, and we have continued to be so very supportive of this legislation. Pharmacy dialysis drugs, Senate Bill 636. This is being brought forward by Senator Link and would amend the Pharmacy Practice Act, specifically a section on exemptions. So this is being brought forward by a company that has um, a pharmacy as part of its business that processes prescriptions for patients with home renal dialysis. And they need to have the fluids, the disolate fluids that need to be able to be shipped to the patient. And because of the, the enormous quantities that are shipped to the patient, it's being shipped directly to the wholesaler. In this company, the wholesale facility is at a different place than the licensed pharmacy reviewing the prescriptions. And the department has stated that they would have to license that additional facility as a pharmacy. Well, we've been working with this company and other stakeholders to limit, to narrow the focus of this medication just to the disolate fluids, not take, not any additional drugs, um, and also just allowing the devices. So just the fluids and the devices and making sure it's for just um, peritoneal home renal dialysis um, with uh, patients with end-stage um, renal disease or re renal disease and not just chronic kidney failure. So we have had an amendment that moved this forward. It has gone out of the Senate, it's now on the Senate floor, and hopefully with an approval of another floor amendment should be moving on in the next couple weeks. 
House Bill 3388 would require home medical equipment providers and pharmacies that dispense pressurized oxygen uh, to patients and other oxygen delivery systems that we would have to inform a fire department or the protection district of the, the patients who are using this, these, the, these oxygen in their homes. Um, we have severe concerns about this. This is being brought forward by the Peoria um, Fire Chief and Representative Gordon Booth has introduced this bill, but we have severe concerns in, in, in the relation of this bill violating the patient confidentiality of our patients. We understand the fire department's endeavor of wanting to increase safety, but we also have to make sure that we have a hard line on protecting our patients' confidentiality of the treatment that they use in their homes. This also does, um, bill does not provide any liability protection or immunity protection to a pharmacy or medical equipment provider. Um, this bill doesn't have a funding mechanism, doesn't provide any type of universal reporting so that we make sure that the reporting would be done in the same way in Chicago and Joliet, Rockford, Peoria, Marion, and Cairo. We have to make sure that this is done the same way in all 102 counties and all the other local municipality and fire districts throughout the state. So right now we've been working with the fire, um, the fire chief and his um, um, related departments that are supporting this bill and trying to come to some type of solution. We're trying to encourage the continued use of voluntary reporting, which is not being widely used from what we've been able to determine. And we hope that we can come up to a solution that still protects patient safety and, and provides more information to, to the fire departments. I always like to end on a bill that makes me laugh. So uh, House Resolution 30, Zombie Preparedness Month, being brought forward by Representative Welch. And this would designate October of 2017 as Zombie Preparedness Month. Now, again, this is a resolution, it's not a bill. And it would just encourage um, citizens throughout Illinois to make sure that we have 72 hours of emergency supplies in our home. So let's talk a little bit more about the IPHA legislative initiatives for this year. So this is a year that is very important for us for when it comes to the Pharmacy Practice Act. Every 10 years it comes up for renewal and this gives us an opportunity to take a look at what do we need to change fundamentally to help move the profession forward to the next evolutionary step and start looking at practice in 2028. So we are working with not only ourselves um, trying to come up with with um, with proposals, but also with ICHP and IRMA and other pharmacy stakeholders to make sure that we have a coordinated voice as we go forward and a uniform voice as we go forward with other stakeholders, including Med Society and the department to make sure we come to an agreed bill so we can take pharmacy to the next step in, in helping assist our patients for the next 10 years. We are still working on a pharmacy managed care and pharmacy benefit manager um, reform legislation. It may be in a couple parts, depending on how we work this this year, depending on how court cases go in other states, but we're still going to be focusing on audit protection, medication synchronization, and transparency reform, and increased enforcement for the Department of Insurance against PBMs and make sure they have enough oversight over these PBMs and the abuses that are being brought on by pharmacy. In addition, we'll be looking at the same aspects under Manage Medicaid as the abuses that have been that have been performed upon pharmacies under that system since the expansion of the Affordable Care Act has had damaging, um, daily damaging impact on pharmacies in being able to have sustainable practices. One of the issues of a very serious nature that we are working on getting uh, working with a sponsor on right now, and it's not been filed yet. And this is on robberies and burglaries. We are seeing an increase in robberies and burglaries in Illinois of our, of our pharmacies, and it has to stop. And we have brought forward legislation that would increase the penalties severely for those individuals who decide to do that to one of our pharmacies. If a pharmacist, a student pharmacist or technician would be either have an assault or a battery brought upon them, um, during the course of their duties, it would be considered an aggravated battery and aggravated assault. So it would take it up a level. If an, a pharmacy is robbed or, burglary, or, or burgled, it would be the same as if they were robbing a bank or a church or other protected bu uh, business. And 
for the controlled substances that are that are taken from our pharmacies there would be an increased penalty for possession of those medications up to a two hundred thousand dollars fine minimum for any amount in possession and a class two felony so we're still working on on getting a sponsor for this bill and so we can introduce that during hopefully the later part of the spring session here one of our bills that we'll still that we're working on um, over this last couple weeks has been House Bill 3833, which is our state level provider status and amending various components of the insurance code and also making sure that the insurance um, plan designs also recognize that uh, for payment for pharmacist patient care services in addition to the prescription product. We're also working with Senate Bill 1944 on amending the uh, Hypodermic Syringe and Needle Act to increase the limit from 20 at a time up to 100, not only for helping increase access to safe needles for those individuals who need it, but also decreasing the prescription necessary barrier um, for our, our um, patients who have health conditions that require syringes like our patients with diabetes. We have put in a bill, um, at least to start the discussions, of trying to move Illinois to an all electronic prescription state by January 1st of 2022. So these are some of the major initiatives that we're working on for you over, over at least introductory, introducing this year and working with, with everyone as we go through the next two years of this General Assembly. So this is gonna be a big year for us, so please keep a contact and eye on those farm flashes as they go out because we will need your help on each and every one of these bills. So let's talk a little bit about the budget. We are now in month 20 without a budget and it's a disgrace. We're a national laughing stock. And as we, we've gone through various components of having decreased Medicaid re, um, dispensing and then uh, dispensing reimbursement rates, and then it's gone back up again. We've had court decisions that now um, basically put 90% of the budget in operation under 2015 revenue levels with out with a tax increase that um, actually got rolled back. So we're having a severe um, issue with the money that's being allowed to be spent and the money that's coming into the state. So the state's looking at being close to almost $11 billion behind in invoices at this point. And we're seeing a, a continued issue with the stress it's being put on by higher education. And that affects us because of our three state-sponsored pharmacy colleges of pharmacy. And we have to make sure that we are continuing to work with our legislators and encouraging them to come to a resolution soon, not only for the good of Illinois, but we want to make sure that we preserve our three state sponsored pharmacy schools. So how to meet your legislator. Now, of course, we'll go over this in more detail for those of you that will be attending us at Legislative Day. But again, just make sure to be courteous and introduce yourself. These individuals are normal everyday people. And one thing to remember with our members of our General Assembly, we're at a time where we do not have any health care professionals as members of the General Assembly. So reach out to your representative, reach out to your senator and say, I am a pharmacist. I'm here to help you with understanding any pharmacy related issues and assist them with those questions. A lot of them reach out to us and we do it. We do a great job with trying to assist them and, and educate them on the issues. But we need that local flavor and that and that focus that you can bring in showing how that affects your community, your patients with the overall issues that we're trying to accomplish through our legislation, legislative initiatives. Now remember, don't be rude, don't be threatening, don't bribe them. There's these things, don't be self-righteous and all-knowing or saying, because you did this, you need to do that. Be respectful. They're, they're, they're trying to do a job and we need to help them do it better. So let's quickly just review some federal legislation. Specifically, let's look at pharmacy provider status. Pharmacy provider status got renewed again for the third um, session of Congress that we've been working on. There's actually about two and a half sessions of Congress that we've been working on this. And it's with HR 592 and S109. These are identical bills to the ones that were during the 114th Congress. So we're in the 115th this session. And what was really great to see specifically with the House um, 
reintroduction, we almost got about 120 co-sponsors right away. Right now we're at about 134. Eight of those are from Illinois, which is wonderful. Um, this is still a bipartisan effort. And not that I have, I'm singling out just two of our congressmen that have continued to be resistant to supporting our initiatives, and mainly because of cost, and we'll talk about those reasons here in a minute. But we still need to encourage our representatives to sponsor this bill and to help us move forward with provi getting recognition and paid and reimbursed for our services. So both of these bills would amend um, the Social Security Act, specifically the section on, on Medicare Part B, and addressing those individuals that are in medically underserved areas. Now that is a county definition that's be, that's a federal definition that looks at counties that don't have enough health care services. And if you, there's also definitions for medically underserved populations, which drills down to a municipal level, and then health provider shortage areas, which determines whether or not there's enough health care providers. Now, that doesn't factor us into the equation because, again, we're not providers at this time. It doesn't expand any existing scopes of practice in the state, um, so it is a designation and a payment. So remember, provider status is three things, designation, payment, expansion of scope. So this bill does designation and payment because we would receive 85% of the physician fee schedule, which is what nurse practitioners and PAs receive right now. 79 of our 102 counties are considered to be medically underserved. And that's really hard to think about and get your mind around because if you think about the great health systems and the pharmacies and, and and the entire medical culture that we have in Illinois. Now, a lot of reaction sometimes comes back to us on the 79 of 102 saying, oh, this is a downstate problem or a rural problem, and it's not. Cook County and all the collar counties are considered to be medically underserved. Even with the great um, programs and av availability of services, we just don't have enough facilities and providers in our state. If you take this and add in medically underserved populations and drill down to some of those municipalities, it becomes 97 of the 102 counties. So we do not have enough health care providers. And this is why it is imperative for pharmacists to get provider status. It's imperative for pharmacists to have a prescription authority to take us to that next level and to mainly be there for our patients. They need assistance. They need additional care. And we have to be there for them. Two great articles that kind of help us with our arguments for provider status. One of those, if you look the, at the article on the right, is from the National Governors Association. And I recommend, actually, if you can get a hold of both these articles, I recommend it, but definitely the National Governors Association article on the expanding role of pharmacists. This is a great lay article um, that puts out in plain terms what pharmacists are doing today. And um, every time we go into a legislator's office, we get, they get both these articles. Um, and actually, they also get a painful prescription, which is a great a PBM article we can talk about at a different time. Um, but then there's the health affairs article here from November 14 on pharmacy deserts. It's very similar to the, de the, the term food deserts, except in relation to pharmacy. And it was showing how on the south side of Chicago and some of the west side of Chicago, we just don't have enough pharmacies. And a lot of that is we've had a number of pharmacies close over the years. And what is that because of? Reimbursement issues. And it gets back to that core problem we talked about earlier. If, as long as pharmacies are continued to be abused and not treated as true health professionals, and all of health care is not treated appropriately, we're going to continue to see these decreases in access and, and these struggles for quality care in our state. So the main issue with the provider status bill not moving on a federal level is because we have not yet to receive a CBO score, a Congressional Budget Office score. And this, the, the reason why we're concerned about a CBO score is the CBO has to look at the legislation as it is written. So in relation to the provider status bill, it would only look at the costs that are incurred under Part B because that's all the legislation talks about. It doesn't talk about the cost savings or any of the cost implications that may happen to Part D, but the definite cost savings we're going to see in Part A, which would happen with re emissions and re-emissions. So we have to use the examples and the successes that we've achieved under Medicare Part D, specifically with, with medication therapy management. 
Part D is continued to remain under budget projection because of MTM interventions, and pharmacists do over 75% of those. So we need to continue to encourage you to do those interventions, not only for the better care of your patients, but to show the value of pharmacists. So please do take a look at pharmacistcare.org. It's the coalition that's been formed um, both with pharmacy and patient groups to help move this forward. And IPHA is a member of the coalition, not only as an individual member, but also as a member through the National Alliance of State Pharmacy Associations. So again, our road to provider status is multi-tiered. It's about federal level, which we've talked about, state level, which we've talked about, and then we have to continue working with private payers to try to get that recognition for us to move forward with the evolution of our profession. Again, here's some references if you need to take a look at any additional, more in-depth additional information about what we covered today. But I really want to thank you for taking time to learn more about the, at the legislation and regulations that are being brought forward that impact your profession. I really encourage you to try to come to Legislative Day if you're not already going to attend. If you are going to attend, I'll see you on Wednesday on March 15th. And we're going to have a great day. we got the governor coming to, um, to briefly speak to us um, during our Legislative Day, our third year in a row. We've had the governor um, graciously attending. And um, we hope to have um, a, a couple representatives also speaking, which we're waiting to confirm. But again, if you have any questions, not only about the legislation we discussed, any of the advocacy efforts, or anything about IPHA and making sure that you're a member and continue to be a member of IPHA, please feel free to email me or call me anytime. But uh, I mean, in addition to making sure you stay up to date on our farm flashes, please do follow us and like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and also um, the annual meeting link on Twitter. This year we have the annual meeting jointly with the Missouri Pharmacy Association, which is September 7th through 10th, um, going to be in St. Louis. And also follow the, the, the great programs that are being supported by the IPHA Foundation. We're also on Instagram and we're now on YouTube. And um, we'll be shortly having a podcast coming out here in the, in the spring. So again, thank you very much for taking time, not only for the interest of, of your profession, um, but for your practice setting and most importantly for your patients. Thank you and have a good day.